thank you, um, Evelyn and Paula and the other uh, chair staff that um, that we have put together this meeting. Um, I'm very honored to be one of the speakers. My topic today is about the land policy and identity issue um, of the medium of instruction used in Tibetan schools um, inside China. Um, my interest that specifically is about the instructional language, which language is used to teach the class subject in the schools. Um, when I was, like the person just introduced, when I was um, teaching there, and then later as a project officer, we have been a group of, a group of people that have been really work hard to promote the Tibetan to be used as the medium of instruction in schools. Um, but um, uh, basically, what we have uh, what we have to face is an uphill process uh, because um, when you try to uh, support the schools to teach in Tibetan, basically you need to pull all pieces together, like uh, financial support, uh, teacher training, policy support, everything. You, you need to pull all the things together. So it's been difficult, and why it is so? And there is actually. Um, internationally, there are lots of studies about this issue because this is not unique only in Tibetan case. Actually, many parts of the world that has uh, facing this problem. But what I have um, um, looked, the angle that I'm going to talk today is um, is about sort of the, the political angle, but also it can be sociocultural angle that uh, dealing with the. Uh, national identity and also local identity, that kind of issue that is um, reflected in the land policy and that in turn how it make an impact in the, in the school. Um, so uh, in terms of the language, uh, the instructional language, uh, there are actually fewer, especially at the, the, the um, if a student move higher to the secondary school or to the, uh, to the universities, there are less chance that you can receive your education in Tibetan. And actually, the secondary schools that are teaching in Tibetan are really decreasing, uh, facing a lot of uh, both political uh, forces, also the um, economic forces. Um, so the effort that the community has tried the effort that we made by the community to try to establish a school system that is used in Tibetan to teach is um, sort of been difficult, but it's also concurrent, sort of concurrent, you know, it's happening together with the, the from the government side that try to promote a sort of a homogeneous national identity by spreading Putonghua, the Chinese standard uh, um, language, um, throughout state schooling, you know. So it, this process been, has been happening together, and this often leads to sort of unnecessary difficulties <coughs> for the Tibetan students in learning, but also create tenants uh, filled by the locals that looking for sort of a space for your own identity present representation and, and university identity or cultural identity representation. So the choice of the instructional language like what the, um, the, uh, Dr. Devon has expressed that uh, it's the, the language is also represent, the choice of the language also represent sort of the power relations of what you can, what kind of access one is entitled to have and et cetera. So, um, but my, so my question here is that why should <coughs> the notion of a homogeneous national identity replaced, in this case, represented by the uh, language and culture of the um, dominant um, group of, of Chinese, represent the, uh, or replace the local, um, um, la local identity uh, 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 that differs from it. So in order to look at this kind of dilemma of in one way, that it, it, there is a tendency of replacing, and in the other way, there is locals try to find a space to represent it. So in order to look at this dilemma, it's important to look at the forces that shape what is happening there, now, as well as the local perspectives to it. So for my today's topic, I will first go on with a little bit about the uh, studies has, that has been done uh, at the international level. 
Um, also, there, there, I, I will also talk about the studies that has been done um, locally by the Tibetans, also by the Chinese government. And then I will specifically talk about the language policy change in the 90s and uh, the theories, uh, models that it are the base of the China's uh, minority policy that shape what is going on in the schools. And uh, finally, I will present a case study to illustrate what is exactly going on in the schools. Um, first of all, I will show you a linguistic map. And that purple color is where we are talking about. Uh, purple color represents the Tibetan speakers where they live. Um, you, can, you can see that is a big portion of the land. Um, but uh, numerically, if you compare it, compare it to the China's population, numerically it is small. But if you, if you ever go into an autonomous prefecture or county, uh, the proportion of the, the percentage of Tibetans living there, the percentage of the Tibetan speakers are very high. And you have, uh, at some point, you have over 90, 97% of the people are all speaking Tibetan. In, 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 in some of the counties, and in, in other counties, probably will be around the 50s. But basically, percentage-wise, um, if you look inside the prefecture or the uh, counties, um, it's predominantly Tibetan speakers. But still, we're here today to talk about the minor minority language issue. So uh, there is a theory about what constitutes a language minority. I mean, it's not um, really look at the, numer the numerical, the, the numbers of the speakers or, or, or the other factors. But there's this theory saying if a group that feels their language is, is having a subordinated status compared to the other ones, then this group become a language minority. So in our case, even though that you have people living in that big land, I mean, of, of course, comparing to the numbers with mean, the rest of the population in China, but the population is small, but you have people who live as the main group in their own land, who still constitute as a language minority. And I will go on to say more about that later. But first, I will go um, through a little bit about how and why the medium of instruction, this issue, has been studied. Uh, in international context. There is an increase, um, increasing interest uh, in studying this issue internationally, especially after um, you know, around 1960s, 70s, when many countries gained independence. Uh, the, the, uh, the former colonial countries or, or regions like Hong Kong, uh, East, Eastern Asian countries like Singapore, Malaysia, and then also um, African countries, also uh, India, um, Eastern Europe, you know, the, the former satellite <coughs> nations of the Soviet Union, when they get in independence, and they are facing with the, the, the issue of making a national policy of them, you need to decide what language will be the official language to be, be the instruction language. So um, then there are increasing studies about and also, though all those countries, they also had the problem when they're in the colonial time, when generally that it is the fact that the colonial language become, became the official language, became the, the language of instruction. So when they had that issue in the past, and then now they're independent, again, they are facing the same kind of issue of choosing whether you want to choose a super language or your, your own language or the language. What about the small groups? That is not the majority of them. Yeah. So there is an increasing interest of the study. And then um, lots of the studies that look at the educational implications first, um, whether a language, um, whether a language, a familiar language or unfamiliar language is used in schools what kind of impact that has down to the students' learning. So um, well, basically, all of these studies, most studies recognize that um, when you talk about the medium of, of instruction, it is not an education question only. 
it touches about other aspects of you know, sociocultural factors, uh, whether one language is used and how, how uh, one a language is used, how that give um, a psychological impact to students, you know, how that affects your know, students' self-esteem, etc. So uh, while recognizing the complexities of choosing a, a, an instructional language, um, generally the studies has taken different approaches that enact different forces. That some talking about educational impact, uh, some talking about sociocultural uh, implications, some talking about some looking at the um, economic uh, factors. Uh, when a government decide whether they want to provide bilingual education, then it also involving with the expenses. If it's too expensive, then they tend to not to do so, or they leave that burden to the local community to carry on. Or when uh, parents decide, they often dis decide to send their children to the mm -hmm. school where the big language is taught. So, so to believe that it will, it will um, help the students to, their children to, um, to benefit later on, you know, economically. So um, economic considerations has been studied. And also lots of the policies has been drawn upon um, according to, to the economic considerations. And then there is an increasing dis study that look at the political implications. And it, it really look at as a correlation of how when a nation try to build a national identity and they try to enforce a language that represent that national identity. And then also there is um, examples from Basque countries, or countries, and the countries, 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 right? Basque countries. And also in Quebec, uh, where you have a, a regional national, nationalism going on, um, there is a competing forces for that, for which language can be used. And then specifically that language issue is also looked at upon as a right issue, whether one is receiving your own language become a right issue that we are in, 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 uh, And it's not only uh, have been approached as a linguistic human rights issue, but also um, looked upon as a political autonomous rights issue uh, in the studies, especially done in, in the former Soviet Union um, nations. Uh, th those are sort of the studies that has been the approach that that studies has been taking on in terms of the what language to be used in schools. Um, inside China, by the uh, Chinese scholars and also Tibetan scholars, this issue has been discussed generally for under the category of bilingual education. So some of the studies, especially if it is from the government side, it will talk about the achievement that government ha has been done in order to provide bilingual education. Or some would make um, arguments based on the you know, educational uh, impacts or uh, identity side that they talk about uh, what kind of, what combination of languages should be provided so that learning is more effective. Um, for the Tibetan scholars, the studies specifically there are, uh, some of them move a little bit beyond that, that looking at it not only as a bilingual education, but also look at it as a part of the curriculum. How the school learning will be more effective if we provide it. But again, it is one way to argue for that, for that uh, mother tongue teaching in school. Uh, there are other scholars that has been uh, doing research uh, calling for uh, the enforcement of the law, calling for the, uh, the, the uh, specific regulations to be set upon so that the, the language, uh, that the language can be taught in schools. But um, generally, the approach has been, uh, the studies inside China has been more focused on the educational implications, cultural, sociocultural implications, economic considerations, less on the political implications. Probably it is a bit sensitive trying to, to do it, trying to make an argument that 
talking about only you know, cultural imperialism, hegemonic uh, influence of the super language, etc. Um, and less, even less was done on and approached it as a human rights issue so far. Um, when, when I talk about this um, issue, I would like to, I mean, my main um, uh, um, sort of topic, uh, my main sort of, uh, uh, the thing that I want to talk most today is about the policy change. Um, I want, would like first to uh, introduce you about sort of the theory and the model that the minority policy in China has based on. Because if you look at the minority policy, <coughs> language for minorities is part of that minority policy. Um, and then we sort of have an idea how the policy has been developed, how uh, you know, the, the decision has been made. Um, the minority policy in China was uh, built, was sort of developed based on the Soviet model. Uh, even before 1950s, but specifically after 1950s, China, Chinese government has borrowed uh, the Soviet model for the minority uh, sort of management, minority policy. And uh, um, also the Soviet Union has actively lent their model to China. So uh, uh, there are two basic components that form the minority policy of China based on the Soviet uh, model. First is that it recognized, because it's the communist ideology, it recognized the equal rights among all groups, whether you're big groups or, or you're a small group. It, there is an equal rights. That is a very important feature of the policy based on the Soviet model. And uh, what different from the Soviet model is that the Soviet Union actually recognized that, that all those um, uh, different groups are still like, there are separate nations under a super sort of um, nation state. So it is a multinational uh, sort of state. Uh, for China, they have a decision to make whether they will leave self-determination or, or you know, try to leave it aside and, and only take autonomous rights. So after, there, there is a detailed discuss of that, well, that part of history. <laughs> but uh, at the end, that uh, for the minority policy, it is based on autonomous rights, uh, autonomous regional rights. So in the 50s, when the um, minority policy was first formulated, first, so in terms of our talking today about the language issue, first we know that we have equal rights by the constitution of China. Second, uh, minority language, the Tibetan language, also Tibetan group, was given a status as the um, regional uh, group, or uh, what, what we call in China is like the minor, uh, national minority. So it, you are still part of the national group, but because you are a small number, so you are national minority. So um, those are the models that has been used. Uh, but as you understand that, uh, from 1950s all the way to by the end of 70s, there, there is a lot of ups, ups and downs. So it, the school system and also the whole social system was not very stable. The, from 1980s, when it is more stabilized, the constitution was drafted and published in 1982. And it has, in terms of language, it has two goals. First is to spread Putonghua as the national um, language. And second, it is very clear that the, there is a claim of the equal linguistic rights of the minorities uh, in, in 19, in, based on the, sort of the um, 1982 constitution. Um, of course, there are some scholars saying that um, it's actually a little bit contradictory because it creates, especially in the regional autonomous, um, to the autonomous region, it creates a competing situation between Kunohua and also regional language, etc. But the, the way the minority is managed, the way the minority policy is put forward in China is that it always gives some room for the local leaders to adapt that policy toward their own situation. 
and that give rooms for the leader to perform, but also um, it, then it, it's also um, indicate that it all depends on the leader's vision for education, the leader's vision for uh, what minority will be look like in the future. So that will affect what he's actually doing in their own regions. And that decision, local decision, results in various goals and models of bilingual education uh, in reality. And there are other schools that has tr tried to group what, what are the minority mo bilingual education models are, what kind of stage that bilingual education has gone through um, all over China. And to that the case here, then it's not unique from the rest of the China, because then you find similar cases um, also exist in Mongolia, also exist in Uyghur, um, part of uh, Xinjiang, etc. Basically for, for all of the minorities. So if we look back um, in, um, um, in the 80s, it is still um, more or less the same with the rest of the country, that when you are a uh, um, when you are a minority, when you go to school, you become bilingual. You, you have to become bilingual. And nowadays, it's, it's trilingual. But for the uh, Han people, for a majority, the, um, when we talk about majority, it is, of course, Han Chinese. Even if you're living in a very autonomous region, you can be, you know, you can be uh, OK if you're just monolingual, just you know, in Chinese or in local Chinese. I, I mean, of course, now uh, they are moving toward bilingual, meaning Chinese and English, so two different languages. But for the minorities, um, you go into school, you're always having this situation um, of trying to be bilingual, trilingual, whatever. So um, in, uh, there are studies in China that try to group the policy change from the 50s that is more sort of progressive, what we call pluralistic uh, stage, because of the heavily influenced by the communist ideology of equal rights of the groups. So it gives a lot of groups for, um, for minorities. Uh, but then from um, the 60s to the end of the 70s was always called the monotonist, whatever called. That is the period when Tibetan or other minority languages are banned from the school, you know, the, the old te test were considered as the um, uh, feudalist and backward and burned. And that is the period. But generally, <coughs> even among the Tibetan scholars or Tibetan cultures who work in it, work in now, uh, consider from the 1980s to now a second pluralistic stage where you can see from the language policy documents for schools where you can still use Tibetan, etc. But when I read the policy document, I found there was actually a big change in the 1990s. Um, the, because my, my angle to when you read the policy document, I, I specifically look at uh, the, the, the faces that talk about the instructional language. Then you see there is uh, actually a transition, big transition in the 1990s. So from 1962 to 1991, uh, it is explicitly stated in the policy document that one of the policy goal for minorities, for Tibetans in this case, is to establish a school system based on the use of mother tongue as medium of instruction in Tibetan areas. Of course, in addition to a Chinese language system, but there is policy document supporting that you have you can have a separate system. So you, you, um, you can go to, I mean, if the policy goal is to build up schools that from uh, preschool all the way to the university, that uh, it is possible you have a Tibetan language system. But from 1991, the policy language changed. Um, it says it, to establish a bilingual education school system, minority schools in basic education years may still use the mother tongue as the medium of instruction, uh, Chinese language teaching is to be strengthened. So to achieve a smooth transition to Chinese as the instructional language. So there, there is actually a change in the policy document. But then why 
there is a change in the 1990s through this change. And first of all, the, the sort of the biggest change, the biggest factor that affected this change is um, at international level. You know, the, the, our neighbor, uh, Soviet Union, split it in 1991.